Leaves from a Russian Diary. Pitterim Sorokin. Part 2. 1918. Chapter 13. Lasciate ogni speranza voi che entrate. As winter approached, our situation became much worse. Berries and mushrooms disappeared, and the fetching of food from the villages was attended with greatest difficulty. When snow began to fall, the marks of our footsteps made it easier for the head hunters to trace us, and for merely haunting the country around settlements, they now extended their search far into the forests. Sometimes forty or fifty miles away from their detachments these men were killed, but oftener they succeeded in killing their victims. One group of seven fugitives had tramped from Vetluga to Ustiag, a distance of a thousand miles, enduring untold hardships, only to meet death at the end of their journey. All these things made it inevitable that we should leave our forest fastness and return to town. Concluding at last that we had no other choice, we informed our friends who hastened to prepare such refuge as was possible. On the eve of our exodus we moved cautiously a little nearer to the clearing. The next morning I buried my diary in the forest, discarded my worn bark shoes for my old boots, made myself look as much as I could like a local worker, and embracing my friend, who was to start the following day, set off. The distance to Ustiag was forty-seven miles, and I had to enter the town between six and seven in the evening. At six it was dark, and after seven I should have to produce a certificate. Vigorously I set out, knowing that when one's life depends on his feet they usually hold out. On the grey autumn road I met two Bolshevist commissaries, and taking off my cap I greeted them as peasants formerly were accustomed to greet nobility, and they, conscious of their new dignity, responded quite in the old lordly way. Later on I fell in with two peasants, and naturally we began to discuss politics. Speaking of the communist government, which they cautiously alluded to as, your workmen's government, I said, why do you say your workers' government? It is yours also, is it not? Oh. Said one of the women. If this is a peasant's government then I must be a princess. Well, I laughed, if it's a workman's then I must be the czar. Ah. Said the other woman, becoming confidential. When we had that czar there was order, peace, and plenty of everything. Now people are starving and killing each other. Then sinking her voice. Have you heard about the naked man? The naked man? Yes. You know how many people are wandering everywhere hiding from the red devils. It seems that the reds captured a man somewhere in the upper Sukhona. They were bringing him in a boat along the river. Two days ago they stopped for the night in the village to which we are going. Well. They put the man in a hut on the bank, took off all his clothes and tied him hand and foot. Three of the Reds went to the village and the fourth was left to watch. What happened no one knows, but in the morning the guard was found butchered and the man was gone. Last evening one of our lads met a naked man in the wood. He was very frightened, but the naked man seized him, took his coat, trousers, and cap and left him, saying. I am sorry for what I do, and if I live I will pay you. God help that unhappy one now. And she devoutly made the sign of the cross. Carefully avoiding all villages and hamlets, I made my way onward and at a quarter before seven I was safely in the appointed house. Ah! What pleasure after weeks in the wild to wash one's body, to put on clean clothes, to sit at a decent table, to lie down to sleep between smooth sheets. The first part of my revolutionary adventures was over. What was to come was mercifully hidden behind the veil of destiny. An absolutely noiseless life, the existence of a fleshless phantom, I lived in the place of refuge. Never laugh, never cough, never approach a window, never leave the house, be ready at the slightest warning to fly to the lumber room, then remain motionless and still as long as a chance visitor remained, to listen night and day for untoward sounds, these spelled the price of existence. I was like a hermit who has taken vows of perpetual solitude and silence. One day followed another and the more I thought of it the more inevitable seemed the end to my confinement. I knew they were looking for me, knew that my presence in the village was suspected. Sooner or later they would get me. Finally, I came to a desperate resolve. 
My friends, I said that evening as we sat together, I see no use in continuing this frightful existence. I know that I shall be soon arrested, and to stay here longer simply puts this whole household in jeopardy. It is not right for me to go on risking your life and safety. So I am going to put an end to it all, my suffering and your danger. What are you going to do? They asked. I am going to do what our northern hunters do as a last resort when they are fighting for life against a bear. They thrust one fist into the bear's mouth and with the other hand they try to stab him to death with their small knife. Something like this I intend. Tomorrow I am going to walk into the jaws of the Cheka. You are mad. Cried all my friends. But against all their persuasions, I showed them that my present situation was intolerable and that it did not even promise more than a few days additional safety. I admitted that I had no more than one chance in a thousand, but that one chance I was determined to take. I hope I shall never again in life have to go through such a scene of farewell as we endured the next evening. Goodbye, when it almost certainly means goodbye forever, is a terrible thing to say. A mother sending her son into battle knows something of what my wife and I and our faithful friends felt that night. Twice I said goodbye, and twice I turned back. Last goodbyes, last kisses and embraces, last stifled sobs, last signs of the cross on my forehead, last looks, then in my ragged pockets they thrust a few cigarettes for comfort and let me go. As I stumbled into the darkness the thought crossed my mind, there is yet time to return. But no, the die was cast and on towards the dread Cheka I went. Two Lettish soldiers in top boots, each with three revolvers stuck in their leather girdles, met me in the anteroom. Pale faces with red lips and dull eyes that seemed to see and yet not see me, a thick odor of alcohol, this was my first impression of the Cheka. My name is Professor Pitterim Sorokin, I announced. Please let them know that I have arrived. In the dull eyes of the executioners something like astonishment awakened. After a moment of silence one of them rang a bell. At once four armed men entered and stood staring at me. I lighted a cigarette. After an interval one of the soldiers beckoned and I followed him into the office of the head of the Cheka. The house, and even the room, I knew very well. Many times I had been there as a guest. But instead of a comfortable study with books and pictures it was now a filthy den with ragged tapestries, broken furniture, and on the table a pile of dirty dishes and a litter of bottles. Pictures of Lenin, Trotsky, and Lunacharsky decorated the walls. At the table sat Sorbachev, for the moment head of the Cheka. He was one of the local communists, not a particularly bloodthirsty person, but weak before the higher authorities. Sit down. He invited. And allow me to ask you some questions. Where did you come from? From the forests. From which forests? From the Dvina, said I, indicating a direction I had not been. How long have you been in the forests? About two months. With whom? Alone. Where have you been before? In the villages. In which villages? That does not matter. You must name them. I will not name them. I insist. You may insist as much as you like, I will not give any name. Well. Why did you go to the forests? Because your agents paid me too much attention. Besides, I like to be in the bosom of nature. Have you been in Archangel? No. Have you participated in the organization of the Archangel Counter-Revolution? No. We have some evidence you did. I say no. Let me see what sort of evidence you have. This does not concern you. Well. Why did you come to us? To know why I am persecuted and to learn what you are going to do with me. I think you know well why you are persecuted, and as to what we will do with you, I think you know that also. Personally, I would be ready to set you free. But your fate does not depend upon my desire. You will have to be shot immediately. But as you are too big a bird for us, and as your principal activity was carried on in Petrograd and Moscow, we must ask the central Cheka what we shall do with you. You may be sure, however, that this only postpones your execution for a few days. He concluded. Thank you for your candor, 
at least, I said. Now I shall send you to the prison. A few minutes later, accompanied by four armed men, in the darkness of night, I strode to the prison. Approaching it, I looked in the direction where I left my dearest people and sent to them my last goodbye. Lasciate ogni speranza voi che entrate. Take leave of all your hopes, you who are entering here, I remember Dante's words above the gates of the hell, as I entered the gates of the prison. I was in the kingdom of death.